glad you're here. I asked some on the way in, did you get plenty of turkey? And they said yes, and so we opened both doors. So now you know why we have double doors here at Hillcrest. We're glad you're here, and I hope you had a big Thanksgiving season. It is good to see so many visitors and familiar faces. We're thankful you're here. Please come back every time that you are with us. And we are thankful for our friends on Facebook who are listening. It's incredible to me to think about the number of people that we touch beyond these walls every Sunday and Wednesday, the hundreds of people who evidently view these services. And we're thankful for your presence this morning as well. This morning, the title of our sermon is Thankful for Christ and a Loving God. And I think it's very befitting that we end our series by talking about this particular topic. That is, we need to be thankful that God loves us and we need to be thankful that Christ loved us as well and continues to love us. And this morning, we talked about covenant faithfulness in the book of Joshua. And I think the idea of covenant faithfulness is an idea that carries over into the New Testament in regards to the topic of love. And we'll talk about that later on, but the simple fact of the matter is if you love God, you're going to obey Him. There's no doubt or question about that. However, before we begin our topic this morning, I want to say that our world in general has a, view, a very skewed, obtuse view of what love is. If you were to ask any person walking down the street, what is love, you would receive a myriad of responses in regards to that question. Now, some of the responses would probably be very good. Some of them would perhaps be very bad. And a corollary with that particular question would be, what is the love of God? What is God's love? What does that mean to you? And again, there would be a lot of people in our world today who would have a very warped view of what God's love is all about. And we'll talk about that near the end of our sermon this morning, what God's love is and what God's love is not. And I think it's a very powerful lesson for us to consider this morning. Notice what the Bible says over in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. John says, Beloved, let us love one another. Now we've got to realize this John that wrote this book, who was one of the twelve, was one of the twelve who wanted to call down thunder and lightning and hell storms upon those who refused to receive our Savior in a village of Samaria. And now he is the beloved apostle. And he talks about love significantly in all of his letters. And he says, Beloved, that is, those who are Christians who are recipient of this letter, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That is the epitome of God's description. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of for our sins. Now the word propitiation in the King James translation could very well be translated the appeasement for our sins. So just keep that thought in mind when you read through 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. But I think we need to define the word manifest. It is defined as clear or obvious to the mind or eye. And so the point of this passage and the point that I want to make from this passage is that Jesus Christ is the love of God made manifest to lost humanity. We know that God loved us because of Christ. And all we have to do is look at Calvary and see a, a, a Savior covered in blood to know that God loved us to the extent that He was willing to die for us. And no greater love hath any man than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died for each and every one of us. And all we have to do is look at Christ and see a reflection of the love of God. And so that's why it's so important that we study the Gospels and we learn about the character of Christ because He tells us what God's love is and what God's love is not. We have this passage in 4, uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. We love Him because He first loved us. 
God loved us before we ever knew a single thing about Him. And to me, that's a fascinating concept and worthy of some space in our sermon this morning. God loved us before we knew anything about God. It's wonderful to see these babies here this morning. It's wonderful to hear babies crying in the auditorium. And I, I'm always taken back to the time when, when we were having our children and what that meant. Now, I remember when we found out that we were pregnant with our first child, we were getting ready to go and have an ultrasound done. And, and I came home that evening. I was excited. We're going to find out the gender of the baby. And Jada was crying. And I said, what's wrong? She said, this baby's got to have a name before the ultrasound. I said, what are you talking about? We don't even know if it's a girl or a boy. She said, it's fine. We'll come up with names for a boy and a girl. So we took about two hours that evening and came up with a name for this child, boy names and girl names. And of course, firstborn child was Matthew, and that name could very well have been Grayson if it had been a little girl. But we loved him, and we loved all of his brothers before they were ever born. We didn't know a thing about them. We didn't know what they would look like. We didn't know how much they would eat, how big they would grow. None of this. We didn't know how expensive they would be one day. But we loved them before they were ever born. And Jada did everything in her power to take care of her body and to be healthy because we wanted to make sure those children came into this world in great health, that they were strong and vibrant in their birth. And it's the same way that with God's love. God loved us before we ever knew a single thing about Him. He knew all about you. He knows the number of hairs that are upon your head. And He loves you. To the extent that He was willing to send His Son to die for you. Even though He knew that you would make mistakes in your life. That you would transgress God's will. God made provisions for your salvation. Before you ever knew a thing about Him. And so we have this passage over in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 9 through 11. Which I think ties in very nicely with the love of God. And this is what Paul says. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Now a New Testament definition of mystery. Is something which has now been revealed. And I know that's not a dictionary definition. But the New Testament definition of a mystery is something that God has revealed. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. There's that word again. According to the eternal purpose which God purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now it's very significant that God was willing to create even though He knew that we would sin. I don't know how you reason about things, but I'm, I'm a person who tries to solve problems before they ever happen. I will sit down about something that I am purposing to do, and I will try to figure out every possible thing that could potentially go wrong. Now, sometimes I'll miss a few, but I try to think about what could happen <clears throat> in this scenario that would not work out to my benefit. And then I will try my best to remove that variable. It's kind of how I reason about things. You know, the old adage is, what is it? An ounce of provision, pre uh, uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I think that's a, a wonderful concept to follow after. And what if God had that reasoning about our sins? What if God said, you know, I don't have to create. I don't have to create the earth. I don't have to create human beings. I could create all of the animals, all of the things that you see on the face of the earth. But as far as creating man and creating woman, I don't really have to do that. But you see, God did. And what's more is, according to what we've underlined in this passage, it was according to His eternal purpose, which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, that lost humanity could potentially be saved through the blood of Christ. Before the first foundation stone was laid upon this planet, God had purposed within His heart to send Jesus to die for our sins. I can't imagine any greater love that God would even be willing to create knowing that one day 
Jesus would have to die in a horrible sort of way for our sins. But he went on to create anyway. So how do we demonstrate our love for God? We know that he's demonstrated his love to us through Christ Jesus. That is the manifold wisdom of God was revealed through Christ. The, the love of God was revealed through Christ. But in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1-3, through 3, John says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Here we have a twofold view of what love is. We love God when we keep his commandments, but we love God when we keep God's commandments by loving the brethren. That is, if we love God, we will obey him. We will do what he has told us to do. And that word love, whenever you find it in scripture, is almost always fo followed by an action verb. In other words, there is always some sort of action that is tied to the type of love that God has for us or the type of love that we have for God. And I think this is really common sense to understand that in human relationships, if we love somebody, we demonstrate it by our actions, do we not? If we love somebody, we demonstrate it by what we do or maybe in some cases by what we refrain from doing. You're dating some young man or maybe you're dating some young lady and, and maybe you buy them flowers because you love her. And you want to let her know, I love you and so I'm going to buy you flowers. Or maybe you write poems. I don't know if some of you young men are po uh, poets or not, but maybe you write the young lady a, a poem or maybe you write her love letters to let her know how much you love her. Now I think in our day and age that it's, it's about texting. And so I've told people it's digital love letters. That's what we're doing now. Rather than taking an ink pen and writing it on a piece of paper, maybe they convey their love through texting. I don't know about that. Things have changed. But we show our love by what we do. We show our love to our spouses, perhaps by remembering birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Maybe we do something really nice for them at Christmas. Or maybe there are small things that we do for them. I remember that my dad would go to town occasionally to, to buy gasoline and he would always buy my mom a Coca-Cola at the local gas station and bring it home. And it would just tickle my mother to death that my dad thought enough to buy her a Coke in town. But that was his way of showing his love for my mother. And so we demonstrate our love by what we do. And the same is true in regards to our relationship to God. That if we love God, we're going to obey His commandments. That's how we show God that we love Him. In 2 John chapter 1, verses 4-6, through 6, John says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth. Now, there are those who speculate that the children in this passage really refers to the church that John is addressing. As we have received a commandment from the Father, and now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. To walk in the truth, we must know and practice God's will for our lives. In John 17, 17, and it's misquoted up here, the Bible says, Sanctify them through thy word, thy, through thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay? Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so if we're going to be obedient to the commandments of God, number one, we've got to know them. Got to know them. And so that means to me that we've got to study God's word, whether in private settings in our home or whether in public settings such as Bible classes like we have here at Hillcrest. And so let me encourage you to study the Bible whether it's in your home or whether it's in a public setting, we want you to be at the assemblies of the church for Bible study because it's important that we know God's Word so that we can obey it and follow it and demonstrate our love for God. And that word sanctified in John 17, 17 means to set aside as being holy. So when we study the truth and we apply it, 
We are God's peculiar possession unto holiness. For a moment, though, I think we need to talk about what God's love is. And in a few slides, we'll talk about what God's love is not. Number one, God's love is long-suffering. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is, Jesus is coming again, if you look at the entire context of what's being said there, there by Peter, but He gives people time enough to repent of their sins. Several years ago, right after Jada and I had married, we found out that she was getting ready to have Matthew. He was born in 1998. In and around that time, I found out that one of my uncles was diagnosed with stomach cancer. He went to the hospital. The doctors operated on him. They removed that cancer. When he came home from the hospital, I went out and visited with him. And in that visit, he said, Johnny, when I get strong enough, I want you to baptize me. And I said, that's great. Do you want to go and do that right now? We were literally less than a mile from the church building where I was baptized, where my mother was baptized, where most of my family is buried, the Nat Hill Church of Christ. I said, that's great. Can we go do that right now? He said, no, I want to wait until I'm a little bit stronger. And so about every week or two weeks, I'd go by and visit him, and I would say, I remember what you said about wanting to be baptized. Why don't we go do that right now? He says, no, I want to wait a little longer. And so weeks turned into months. Months turned into about a year, and he never decided that he wanted me to take him and immerse him. There were people in my family who talked him out of it, as a matter of fact. But that didn't keep me from trying, and that didn't keep the preacher at that local congregation of the Lord's people from visiting with him and encouraging him to go ahead and be baptized. And then we got the call one day that he was at the hospital in Tullahoma, that he had had a serious heart attack and that he was not expected to live very much longer. We got ready, we drove to the hospital, and there he was on a breathing machine, and he never regained consciousness. I really believe that God gave my uncle sufficient time to obey the gospel. I believe that his prolonged life after learning about the stomach cancer was an expression of God's long suffering toward him. He never obeyed the gospel. Never darkened the door of any church building during the entirety of his life. And I had to preach his funeral. One of the hardest funerals that I have ever done. To know that he was that close and that he had never obeyed the gospel. God is long suffering toward us. We're not willing that any should perish. But there is a time when the long suffering of God comes to an end. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. After we die, God's long suffering is over. All we look forward to from that point on is the judgment of God. Whether we've been found faithful or we've led wicked lives, God's long-suffering is over when we pass or when Jesus returns. God's love is also sacrificial in nature. To those of you who are children of God, this is a no-brainer. John 3.16 and then verse 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have life everlasting. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The sending of Christ was not an act of condemnation. In other words, it was not God's intent to send Jesus so that people would be lost. But sort of a, a, a consequence of Jesus' coming would be that there would be those who would be lost. But God loved us to the extent that He gave His only begotten Son. He loved the entire world. And I think sometimes when we read through that passage, we think of the world as being this sort of shapeless blob, when in reality God died for each and every one of us as individuals. And notice that action. We talked about love coupled with an action. And the action verb there is God gave. He gave His monogunes, the only begotten, the unique Son of God, to die for our sins. God's love is sacrificial in nature. 
And it's the same sort of love that is expressed in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 for the church. Where the Apostle Paul says that Christ gave his blood for the church, for the bride. It's the same sort of love that husbands are supposed to have for their wives. As mentioned by Paul in the book of Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. God's love is sacrificial in nature. But I fear in regards to the topic of love that there are many people in our world today who do not understand what sacrifice is all about. What it means to give up something. Or to sacrifice something that we hold dear so that we can be a disciple of Jesus. Something that they were more than willing to do evidently in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 verses 9 and following. When we love someone, there are times when we have to love sacrificially. We have to give up something so that we can serve them better. And God's love for us is sacrificial in nature because God in the flesh, Jesus, was willing to shed every drop of blood for you and me. Willing to die in a horrible sort of way. For a moment, we need to talk about what God's love is not. Number one, God's love is not an excuse for us to do whatever makes us happy. And I've heard that a lot over the years. You talk with someone about a situation in their life that is morally amiss, and they say, well, you know, I think God would want me to be happy. And I tell people, maybe not. And you know, when I tell people that, sometimes their jaw drops open when I say to them, well, maybe God does not want you to be happy. In essence, God may want you to live a life wherein you are persecuted for what it is that you believe. I mean, after all, we have passages like Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, and other passages that we could cite this morning where we understand that if we're going to live godly, we're going to be persecuted. In Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of happiness in the sense of, uh, of overwhelming joy in being persecuted. There is godly contentedness, which is the definition of blessed there. There is godded, godly contentedness in being persecuted. But as far as it being a really feel-good situation where someone is making fun of you and ridiculing you or maybe torturing you for what you believe, there's not a lot of happiness in the sense of worldly happiness in that kind of setting. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. It is inconceivable that some have reached the conclusion that the love of God means that God wants us to be happy no matter what choice we are making in our lives or whatever decision we want to pursue, that God wants us to be happy. I've heard people who are living reprobate lives, lives that are described as being an abomination in God's Word, and have those people say in very public setting, well, God wants me to be happy. God is love. And since God is love, God wants me to be happy. And that means He wants me to be happy with whatever choice I've made in my life, no matter how sinful or reprobate that choice is. And brethren, nothing could possibly be further from the truth. There are times when you will have to suffer for what it is that you believe. There are times when you will have to make decisions regarding your Christianity that will not make you happy. But that's what God calls us to do. I would also add to this, God's love is not an excuse for one to be disobedient. Many have excused their disobedient behavior by saying, a loving God will not punish them for their transgressions. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, Paul says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The opposite of God's love is 
God's wrath, God's judgment in my estimation. And in order for God to be a loving God, there is something that we must be saved from. And that is we must be saved from the wrath that comes from the judgment that is rendered upon the wicked. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, God loves me. It doesn't really matter what I do because he's, he's love. And so they think, for whatever reason, that gives them an excuse to be disobedient in their Christian walk. Nothing could be further from the truth. Remember those passages that we read over in 1 John? Where it says if we love God, we're going to do what? We're going to obey His commandments. That's what we're going to do. But somehow people have so warped God's love in our society that they think that disobedience is fine because love is something that covers all of our sins. In one sense it is. In the sense that Jesus died so that the world might potentially be saved through obedience to the commandments of God. But in another sense, to say that God's love covers our sins like a blanket and God does not expect anything of us is really a mistreatment of the biblical topic of love. But that's the conclusion that some, even in the Lord's church today, have reached. God loves me, so I can do whatever. It doesn't matter. God's love will cover doctrinal or moral error nothing could be further from the truth when you study God's holy writ and so we have people who have this erroneous concept of what God's love is and what God's love is not I'm thankful that God loved us and that he sent his son to die but the grace of God is contingent upon our obedience we're saved by grace through faith Ephesians chapter 2 Meaning that it takes more than just God's grace. It also takes personal belief in God. But beyond this, it takes one who is willing to confess the name of Jesus, Romans 10.10, 10, uh, and be immersed so that their sins can be forgiven. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. The gospel saves. And that's what we have to be obedient to. Remember that passage that we just looked at in 2 Thessalonians? 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains what the gospel is. He says, Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which ye are saved. If you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again, and uh, again the third day according to the Scriptures. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. We have to obey the gospel to be saved. And we obey the gospel if you read Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 by being immersed. God's love is available to every person who lives on this planet. And every person who is living, who draws breath, can potentially be saved if they obey the gospel. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. God loves you. And his son paid a terrible price to make that love manifold or to make that love known unto you. A horrible price. And the enormity of his sacrifice underscores, I think, the enormity of sin in our lives, how terrible it really is. And instead of making excuses for our sins, instead of saying God wants me to be happy because he's a God of love, Instead of saying, it's okay if I'm disobedient because God loves me and he's going to overlook this, why not seek and effectuate his will for your life? This morning, if you've not been baptized, we want you to do that because a loving Savior died to make it possible for you to be in his presence and in the presence of Jehovah God for an eternity in heaven. If you've become unfaithful, based on our reading this morning from 1 John, chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. If you're willing to confess that sin and repent of it and ask for the prayers of this body of believers, He's willing to forgive you if you've fallen short. This morning, we beg you, if you really believe that God loves you, to respond in a positive way to the Lord's invitation by coming forward if you need to be baptized or if you need the prayers of this body of believers as we stand and sing this song of encouragement.